Now, finally, as a way of attempting to jumpstart or extending a new approach to an overall feeling of stagnation within particularly the men's rights portion of the manosphere, uh, which others have suggested to me and I'd be inclined to agree, is plagued by overzealous self-policing and an inordinate amount of talk about repairing relations between men and women instead of securing freedom and prosperity for all men and boys, be they single or otherwise, and, and other ineffective doctrines. In hopes of mitigating this, uh, I'm going to be discussing how this oversensitivity towards being perceived as misogynist has essentially stopped the men's movement directly in its tracks, entrapping it in a tiger's pit of back and forth with feminist trolls, you know, for Trell and the like, where all that's ever discussed by MRAs is, quote, you know, I'm not a misogynist, you're a misandrist. And the feminist, of course, will rebut with, misandry isn't real, silly, you're a misogynist, repeat ad infinitum and nothing ever gets done, ever. So. With that said, I maintain that the men's movement is a strictly non-violent movement. We do not advocate violence as a method of achieving our objectives. So to adhere to this, we need to be non-violent in our methods and actions, which leaves us nonetheless in a position of war, but in a metaphorical war, a war of words fought on the theater of perception. And on this battlefield, any soldier that appeals to the sensibilities of the general public in too extreme a fashion has his weapons instantly malfunction on him. It's a parameter of this theater of war born out of the fact that our society is set up to fear extremes, even when extremes are perfectly justifiable and rational in response to embedded extremes that have been normalized on this battlefield where perception is war and victory. So very well, uh, let's test the limits of your aversion to all things extreme. Barbarossa calls up the New York issuer of marriage licensees for an inquiry. Now, he asked the person who answers if she could be so kind as to explain to him the process of how one would go about obtaining a marriage license for the purposes of elopement, and in doing so is particularly specific about whether or not, at any point in the process, in the transition from being single to married, is it mentioned that upon making this status transition, one's assets and properties are explicitly defined as, as being now split between the two parties in marriage. She answers that no such stipulation is mentioned. And it then dawns upon Barbarossa that upon entering into one of these marriage contracts, a man unknowingly signs away his wealth and property to a woman without giving written consent. A de facto divorce protocol has been agreed to. Divorce proceedings in the event are simply after the fact details. Barbarossa then realizes that it could very well have been him had he not discovered the men's movement who would have married into one of these situations. And thus it could also very well have been him who would, upon his divorce, be forced into a form of modernized slavery where my paycheck, the manifestation of my labor, would be garnished for the purposes of paying alimony to a woman who had no misgivings about visiting this legalized slavery on my person. Now, Barbarossa knows himself very well, and he knows that he hates violence, and he knows that he'll go to great lengths to avoid it. And yet, you know, a part of him cannot shake the nagging suspicion that if he ever found himself enslaved in such a manner, well, Let's just stop there and say that Barbarossa isn't getting married. If you're a visual listener to any degree, then hopefully that little digression painted the proper picture in your mind. Now, I took you to the precipice of extremism, the place where no one wishes to go because in the end, this entire so-called movement is predicated on not sounding extreme. So I took you to an extreme. I let you peer over the edge to satiate your obsession, not because I want you to embrace that extreme, but because I want you to know what it looks like and calmly, without fear, understand why you naturally don't wish to be there. I don't pretend that the extreme is a place I want to be, but I also don't pretend that without access to the proper education, I couldn't have ended up there myself. Now, if these people uh, in the men's movement had any real interest in stopping misogyny, they would ask themselves why feelings of hatred might manifest within men, particularly men that have been through a nasty divorce, or that have had their children stripped away from them. Instead, they simply, like has been the status quo for millennia, try to ostracize and marginalize these men simply for experiencing the full range of human emotion, that is, happiness, joy, fear, confusion, anger, and yes, even hatred. They go on and on telling us that feminism is hatred against men, and then when women use the power feminism has granted them, they do nothing but spit on the men when they exhibit the same hatred back. It's actually a subtle form of male dehumanization. Women hate because of feminism. Feminists hate because of feminism. But men, you see, men hate because they have somehow failed with women. It's their fault. It's the same old pussy pass bullshit. Now, if you agree with me that alimony or, or child support 
or being thrown in jail for child support non-payment or alimony non-payment is a form of modern day slavery, we have to ask ourselves who then is the slave and who is the slave owner? Well, we know that a man making alimony payments upon the annulment of a marriage in which he never explicitly or contractually agreed to render these payments upon said annulment is in fact enslaved. The woman who walked into the divorce office is in fact the slave owner. Now, as in, in early American slavery, there is a slave, there is a slave master, and there is a legal climate that allows the enslavement of others. As with American slavery, there was nothing illegal about owning slaves. There is nothing illegal today with forcing someone to give up the fruits of their labor under the threat of jail time to a woman one was once married to. Are there noted differences between early American enslavement of Africans and the enslavement of men via alimony in modernity? Absolutely. Nobody denies this, and yet how can one deny the similarities? My videos have shown you, have proven to you, that for example, if you don't, or more importantly, can't pay your child support because you simply don't have the money, you can be imprisoned, locked in a cage. There are men, today, right now, who can't pay child support because they couldn't pay alimony, and some of those men are in jail as I speak. So, to revisit early American slavery and to reiterate, we have a slave, we have a slave master, and we have a legal climate tolerant of a form of enslavement. An African man enslaved in America saw a slave master, which he worked under, tell him, you know, go pick me some cotton, boy. You know, go break your back, boy. You better work or hang, boy. And that slave master reminded him every day, psychologically, that his destiny was being deprived of him. His freedom was being stolen. Every day he was reminded of this by the presence of his slave master. So I'll ask you a question then. Is it surprising that he would hate his slave master? Is it possible that he would see that all of his people, or more importantly, all of the people that looked just like him were enslaved by white slave masters? Would it be shocking to you that he would develop hatred towards white people? Would you treat him as though it was a character deficiency on his part that he developed this hatred? Nonsense. The actions of the slave master would be a pretty damn good explanation for the development of that hatred now, wouldn't it? Let's say the enslavement was reversed. Let's say all slave masters are now black. All slaves are now white. Would a white slave be abnormal or bitter or only angry because he couldn't earn the approval of black people? My point? Sometimes hatred is earned. It doesn't make it any more healthy for the person experiencing it, but sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes, groups of people behave in such a way and in such large numbers that groups of people affected negatively by the original group's actions begin to develop a collective hatred. Hatred, after all, is there for a reason. It exists for a good damn reason. Women hate, and so do men. And some men, just like some women, hate for a good damn reason. Some men have a woman in their life that used a completely legal process to literally enslave him. Some men see a great many women doing this, and they begin to hate women just like the slave eventually develops hatred for the people enslaving him. Now, looking back on this, when, when, when men actually achieve full equality under the law, and when alimony is looked at as it should be, that is, a means of enslaving people, I don't want to be the person that is remembered for telling men, yeah, you know, you've been enslaved, but don't be bitter. You know, don't be angry. You know, because God forbid the people doing the enslaving be subject to some actual scorn or hatred. These people in our movement that harp on about misogyny. Have you ever been taken to the cleaners in divorce court? Have you ever been deprived of your children and your money or your freedom? Have you? No? Okay, so shut the fuck up and how about you allow the men undergoing this the full range of human emotion? How about you stop telling these people what they're allowed to feel? How about you wait until your paycheck gets garnished before you even see it to go to some female so she can stay in your former house and fuck her new boyfriend while you don't even know if you're going to be homeless in a week? Yes, it happens a hell of a lot more than you think. And if you've gone through that, then you can come on your little high horse and tell men to check their misogyny. You know, go through the divorce court, get fucked over, pay attention to the gender that's doing the vast amount of fucking over and the gender that's getting fucked, and then lecture us on how and why hatred is so damn bad for us, you, you sanctimonious hypocrites. Hate doesn't come out of nowhere, people. It exists as a defense mechanism. Sometimes it is there to remind you that this person or these persons could very well make your life a living hell. Be suspicious of them. They've earned it. The divorces, you know, the way women have used children as bargaining chips to be leveraged against men, the way they've stolen male wealth, you think that, it, that eventually some men wouldn't succumb to the allure of hatred after 50 years of this constant barrage? 
Like early American slavery, the fact that alimony was and still is legal should by definition produce some hatred of women and men having their wealth stolen from them. It's a simple product of human behavior. Feminism is the overarching tolerance of a profoundly evil ideology. Each slave is affected by the wider legality of feminism, but each slave also has a slave master that he has to see every day that forces him against his will by falling back on the profoundly evil yet legal forces of feminism to provide to her a quality of life she would not be able to provide without access to the fruits of his labors. If the same amount of men were divorcing women in the same numbers, you know, getting them locked up, accusing them of crimes they didn't commit, you think that some women wouldn't be developing hatred for men? Now, I don't condone, I want to be clear, I don't condone hatred against women, but I'm certainly not one of these people that are going to treat you like some damn fucking leper if you do. You know, instead of these people who purport to care about men and then go ahead and label you a misogynist, uh, just like some card-carrying feminist if you're having trouble not letting, you know, these feelings develop into hatred, I'm not going to label you and I'm not going to spit on you or attempt to ostracize you. What I'm going to do is to help you channel that into something that benefits men and, and yourself. Uh, these guys who care more about, you know, proving to feminists that we don't hate women uh, than they do about helping men that have been so marginalized and attacked that they just don't know how else to react but to hate women, fuck those guys. You know, I'm not going to reject you. I'm going to show you how to simply stop giving a damn and, be and begin worrying about yourself. And once you do that, uh, once you can finally just let go, uh, you'll see. You'll never hate anybody ever again. So, you know, I've been talking for a while now. Uh, this video is uh, probably at least over an hour. So I'm going to stop it right here and uh, further videos to come in the future. Uh, I apologize for the length of this video, but I really feel that I had to get a, 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 a comprehensive uh, encapsulation of all the ideas that I've been talking about recently uh, with a couple new, new concepts added in. So uh, if you enjoyed, please subscribe. Thank you for listening.